Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, I'm Joseph Pierce, and welcome to this episode of The Authority. And the authority we're going to be looking at this time is Hilaire Belloc, a great favorite of mine, and one who was very, very important upon my own journey to Christian conversion, my own journey to the Catholic Church. So, um, in many ways, uh, it's a joy for me to be able to pay my tribute and homage to this great Catholic writer. And I wrote a biography of, of Belloc, and, and again, as with my biography of Chesterton, who was another major influence on my conversion, it was an act of thanksgiving. An act of thanksgiving to God for giving me Belloc, but also an act of thanksgiving to Belloc for giving me God, or at least playing a significant role in my coming to Christ. But apart from that act of thanksgiving, that act of homage, um, there were other reasons why I chose to write a biography of, of, of Belloc. Um, and so I, I, I want to maybe just talk about why um, that was before we move into who he was, because obviously I'm going to draw on what I learned in, in the researching and writing of that uh, biography. First was that the existing biographies of Belloc um, were all unsatisfactory. Robert Spates was good, um, but uh, unfulfilling, not comprehensive, I didn't think. It was also written shortly after Belloc's death, so it was a long time in the past. But at least it was sympathetic, and Spate did know Belloc. Um, but it was out of print as well, so not available. And then A.N. Wilson's uh, more recent biography was written when Wilson was on his path from Christianity to atheism, so he's moving in the wrong direction. And there's this element of the sort of the jaded almost cynical view of Belloc's uh, philosophy and theology, his faith, um, that sort of animated that. Although Wilson's a great writer and I enjoyed the biography and learned a lot from it, it was clearly not the definitive biography of Belloc. It still needed to be written. Um, so with those, both of those major biographies of Belloc being out of print and not entirely satisfactory, I thought time was ripe for writing, writing a new biography of Belloc. And I also thought that Belloc needed to emerge from the shadow of Chesterton. So the, the, the George Bernard Shaw, who was a friend of both, both men, uh, he dubbed Chesterton and Belloc collectively as, as the Chester Belloc. In other words, the two men were seen so synonymously that you couldn't tell them apart. You couldn't tell about what, what their beliefs were. One believed the same thing as another, as the other. And although they, they, there's an element of truth to that, they were certainly great uh, comrades in arms, uh, allies in a common struggle against the enemies of the church, good, faithful uh, defenders and warriors of the church militant. Even Chesterton was a warrior of the church militant before he even joined the church militant, um, largely because of Belloc's influence, but we'll get to that. But I just thought it was time for Hilaire Belloc because it, you know, it would be fine if the two men, uh, as as is evident or suggested by by um, George Bernard Shaw's dubbing of them as the Chester Belloc, and what he said is they're like two halves of an, uh, a rather amusing pantomime elephant. And for those of you that don't know what a pantomime is, because it's a singularly British thing, a pantomime horse, so a pa pantomime in general is sort of like a, a lampoon, rambunctious, um, festive, musical stage presentation, usually at Christmas, based loosely normally on some fairy story. It's great fun, certainly not deep art, but but um, but but just jolly, rambunctious and jolly. And one of the one of the, the set characters, um, stock characters, in the pantomime is the pantomime horse. And it's the front part of the horse is a man standing up, upright with the horses, wearing the horse's, horse's head. And the back part of the horse is the man who's obviously leaning forward uh, around the waist of the man in front with his hind legs being the hind legs of the horse, making one outfit. And they walk around as the pantomime horse. Because Belloc and Chesterton were a little bit on the large side, 
and Shaw was very thin and extremely health conscious and a vegetarian um, <laughs> and, and frowned upon obesity, that uh, that he uh, made Chesterton and Belloc uh, the rather amusing pantomime elephant. But the point is, it's implicit that he saw them as equals and he saw them as, as being seen as being equal in the eyes of their contemporaries. But in the years, in the decades since the death of both, both men, Chesterton has, has enjoyed a, a significant revival. Uh, and, and I rejoice at the, 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 the Chesterton revival that we've seen in the last 30 years or so. But Belloc really has sort of been left behind lagging in Chesterton's shadow. And, I, and one of the reasons I wanted to write the biography was to bring Belloc out of Chesterton's shadow so that he could stand in the light of his own right as a as a as um a significant author of the 20th century in his own right so what I, what I want to do for the remainder of this episode is to maybe outline why um uh Belloc deserves to be taken seriously and, and in some cases I want to compare him with um with uh Chesterton so as a poet for me um Belloc is a superior poet to Chesterton. Chesterton wrote a handful of extremely good poems. More than a handful, to be fair. More than a handful. But Belloc was more, more, took more care with his poetry. It's more of a craftsman. Um, so we, we see, for instance, the use of poetry in Chesterton's novel, The Flying Inn, uh, which is sort of especially drinking songs. We see something similar in Belloc's uh, book, The Four Men, which would have been a significant influence on the war poet Rupert Brooke, but that's another question. We then see uh, in Belloc's poem, Lines to a Dawn, this humorous invective. Belloc could humorously lack charity. Is that a contradiction? No, I think it's a paradox that uh, he, he, he vents his spleen against this Oxford professor who had attacked Chesterton. But it's meant to be rampunct, rambunctious and funny. Um, and it'd be, if, if we read it with the sense of humour that's required, uh, I think that it either removes any lack of charity or at least softens it considerably. In either way, it's a rambunctious romp and a very, very entertaining poem, which if we had much more time, I would read. But by all means, take, some up, take up some homework and make a note. Lines to a Dawn by Hilaire Belloc, his defence of Chesterton. Uh, his attack upon the dawn that dared attack my Chester Thorn, in fact. Um, then we have uh, in a poem like Tarantella, um, this sort of, uh, first of all, masterful control of meter. So the poem Tarantella is a dance. Tarantella is obviously Spanish for, um, for uh, um, spider. Or is it Italian for spider? <laughs> One or the other is... It means spider in one or two of those languages. I think the Tarantella might be an Italian dance. But anyway, the, the poem is set in the uh, the um, French-Spanish Pyrenees, up in the Pyrenees Mountains. And it begins, Do you remember an inn, Miranda? Do you remember an inn? And it's a melancholy lament of uh, of the, 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 the abyss that separates... Um, the, the the reality of a moment so this particular evening when they were uh, dancing the tarantella and drinking wine the color of the tar um, this beautiful memory of an evening up in the mountains um, and no more Miranda no more the second part of the poem because it was years ago and that that moment can never ever um, be brought back so this um uh, melancholy. I say masterful control of meter because the first part of the poem is set to the sort of to 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 the rhythm of the dance, the tarantella. You could actually dance the tarantella to the meter of the poem, and the second part is very much this. New, this is not uh, the the meter for dancing. This is the meter for lamenting. And then the end of the road uh, by Belloc. Um, was was the poem that ended his wonderful book, The Path to Rome, which we should say more about. Uh, well, well, we, could, we could do that now, in fact, um, as introduction to the poem. I'm talking about Belloc as a poet still. That 
Belloc is in Toul in northern France, which is the garrison town where he spent his time doing service in the French army. Um, and uh, Belloc, by the way, as regards biographical details, is an Anglo-Frenchman. His father is French, his mother is English. He was born in France, but they had to um, uh, evacuate their home because within months of Belloc's birth, the, the Franco-Prussian War broke out and the Prussian army, the German army, invaded uh, France, uh, and in actual fact, that, that uh, when they returned, when the Bellocks returned to their home, they found that, that the house had been trashed. Their family portraits used as target practice by the troops, uh, the, the, the advancing Prussian troops. And Belloc's uh, family um, escaped on the last train, so it said, to the, North, to the Normandy coast to get to England. Had they not caught that train, Belloc would not have survived, almost certainly would not have survived his first year, because what happened immediately after that was the siege of Paris. And during the siege of Paris, almost every child under 12 months old died as a victim of the famine that was a consequence of the siege. So he escaped by the skin of his teeth, except he didn't because he didn't have any teeth yet. He was a baby. Uh, so Belloc's French father dies when he's young. And so he, he's raised then in England in the county of Sussex, which is his shire. He writes many wonderful poems about Sussex. Um, uh, but he felt very intensely to be a Frenchman. So he didn't feel English. He felt as if he was a man of the shire, a man of Sussex, his own particular shire, his own particular county south of London on the south coast, Sussex, the land of the South Saxons. Um, but he, as a nation, he identified as a Frenchman with his father's side. And that's why he volunteered because he lived in England. His mother was, uh, was English. He, didn't, he wasn't going to be conscripted into the French army, but he volunteered for his national service. So anyway, he, he returns to Toul where he spent this time uh, and was uh, delighted to see the parish church had been um, renovated. And this sort of... He, Belloc saw this as a metaphor for the church herself. So this individual church being a metaphor for the universal church. And he decides an act of thanksgiving that he's going to walk from Toul in northern France by a straight line to Rome, which means going right over the, uh, the high mountains of the Alps. He furthers, and he's going to arrive by, in time for the feast, for mass, to hear mass on the feast of Saints Peter and Paul uh, in the end of June, of course. Uh, and he's not going to use any wheeled thing. So he's going to walk the whole way. He's not going to sleep in a bed. Uh, and he's going to go to mass every day. <laughs> and this is, is this is a very, very deep. This is one of the, by the way, this is one of the greatest books in the English language, May, May you Chay, in my judgment. Because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a div, it's a profound meditation upon the pilgrimage of life. Man as homo viator, man as a pilgrim man, man on a journey, man on the quest for heaven. And the pilgrimage of life is sort of is is the the, the, the wilds uh, Hilaire Belloc's journey is uh, uh, is a metaphor for the journey of his life, and by extension, he, he's an everyman figure. It's a, it's an extension of all of our lives. So what he's done, he he set out good intentions, but making lots of rash vows. So by the time he gets to Rome, uh, he has used a real thing. He has slept in a bed. He um um. Well, the other thing is he was not going to do. He hasn't gone to mass every day. And that was a silly thing to do because if you're walking, you can't guarantee you're going to be somewhere to hear mass uh, every day. Um, but the one thing he does do is he does arrive in Rome in time to hear mass, the feast of St. Peter and Paul. He does arrive at his destination, having broken many of his vows. And of course, this is really that if the rash vows in, in a Dante in, 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 um, in the Divine Comedy, there's a warning against rash vows, taking vows recklessly. These reckless vows were all broken, but the one good vow, the one, the vow to actually get to the eternal city, itself a metaphor for heaven at the end of life, uh, he did succeed in doing. Um, so at the end of it, appropriately enough, there's a poem called The End of the Road. So we just discussed the, the path to Rome. This is a poem about that path, that, tr that trudge, that trek pilgrimage to Rome. The End of the Road by Hilaire Belloc. In these boots and with this staff, 200 leaguers and a half, walk tie, went tie, pace tie, trip tie, marched I, 
Held I, scalped I, slipped I, pushed I, panted, swung and dashed I, picked I, forded, swam and splashed I, strolled I, climbed I, crawled and scrambled, dropped and dipped I, ranged and rambled, plodded I, hobbled I, trudged and tramped I, and in lonely spinneys camped I, and in haunted pine woods slept I. Lingered, loitered, limped, and crept I. Clambered, halted, stepped, and leapt I. Slowly sauntered, roundly strode I, and... O patron saints and angels that protect the four evangels, and ye prophets vel maiores, vel incente vel minores, virgenes ac confessors, confessores, chief of whose peculiar glories, est in aula regis stare, atque orare, et ex orare, et clamare, et conclamare, clamantus cum clamoribus, pro nobis peccatoribus. Let me not conceal it, rode I. For who but critics could complain of riding in a railway train? Across the valleys and the highland, with all the world on either hand, drinking when I had a mind to, singing when I felt inclined to, nor ever turned my face to home till I had slaked my heart at Rome. Well, I hope you think that's as glorious as I do. And what I love about it, or my, many things I love about it, um, right in the middle there, in parentheses, he breaks into prayer. Uh, and it's a, it's a prayer of contrition, a prayer of confession, uh, for the breaking of his vows. In fact, the specific one here, he rode eye, he used a wheeled thing. Uh, but nonetheless, he never turned his face to home that he had slaked my heart at Rome, kept his eye on the goal of heaven, ultimately, homo viator. I'm going to keep it there because I might be tempted to read some more. And in fact, I am. I don't feel that I can, I'm, I'm not because it's not in here. No, I'm not. I'm not going to read Tarantella because it's not in my book, which is a sin of omission I'm going to have to live with. Um, so another poem of his I want to mention um, is Hannah Camille. And, and again, this is a, a poem about the ruin of England using a mill now as a metaphor. Belloc bought a house in Sussex called Kingsland and, and uh, adjoining the house on the property was a, a windmill. And he, Belloc, brought that back into working order and actually became a miller himself, a grounding flower. Um, uh, and, but Hannah Camille's a different mill, a different part of Sussex. But it, the fact that it's in ruin, that it's a, a, a wrecked windmill, is a metaphor for the wreckage of England. And uh, it ends with, you know, never a ploughman under the sun, never a ploughman, never a one. Um, that basically agrarian England has been destroyed uh, by industrialism. It's a lament. Um, but I will read one more poem before we move on from Belloc the Poet, because I want to also talk about Belloc in, 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 in many of the other things he wrote. He was a man of letters like Chesterton, who did not stay within one genre. But uh, one of his greatest poems is Twelfth Night. Uh, and I love this because it's it's sort of like uh, it's got the melancholy of of, of W. B. Yeats, and also a, a touch of the elven Tolkien about it. We can imagine this is not in, just being set in Sussex, which it is. The names of the places tell us that uh, Belloc's beloved Shire, but um, but it could be set in uh, Middle Earth, um, as you will see. I hope. As I was lifting over down a winter's night to Petworth town, I came upon a company of travellers who would talk with me. The riding moon was small and bright. They cast no shadows in her light. There was no man for miles or near. I would not walk with them for fear. A star in heaven by Gumba glowed, an ox across the darkness lowed. Whereat a burning light there stood, right in the heart of Gumba wood. Across the rhyme their marching rang, and in a, and in a, a little while they sang. They sang a song 
I used to know. Gloria in excelsis domino. The frozen way those people trod, it led towards the mother of God. Perhaps if I had travelled with them, I might have come to Bethlehem. Sends shivers down my spine. Um, he meets a ghostly company. Who are they, elves? Who knows? But they're on their way to Bethlehem. All right, so that's Belloc the poet. I could say much more. He's a great poet. I think one of the finest poets of the 20th century, one of the poet, finest poets of, of English literature, period. But if we're going to compare um, Belloc as a, and Chesterton as regards poets, I think if I were forced to choose, I would say Belloc was the greater poet. But as regards novelists, because they both wrote several novels, that Belloc uh, is not as good a novelist, in my, my judgment, as Chesterton. Ch Chesterton wrote uh, some very good novels. Ball on the Cross comes to mind. But The Man Who Was Thursday is a masterpiece of English literature. Um, Belloc wrote nothing of that quality. In fact, some of his earlier uh, novels are somewhat, I think, somewhat stodgy and forced. But he did write, right at the end of his life, uh, a, a lighter novel, which I see as sort of a... It's called Belinda. I see it's something of a pastiche and a gentle satire on, on novels such as those of Jane Austen. Um, but it's 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 full of melancholy and mirth. That's that's a winning combination. A lot of Belloc is full of that mixture of melancholy and mirth. The the end of the road poem we just read is full of that melancholy and mirth. Um, uh, and he, Belloc himself thought that it was the, the best thing he'd, he'd written except for The Path to Rome, which we've already spoken about. I do want to return to The Path to Rome briefly because Belloc also pioneered and, 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 and is the master of a particular literary genre, uh, which I call peripatetic farragos. Not easy to say, um, especially if you had a, a two or three glasses of good uh, French claret and Belloc would approve of you if you did. Peripatetic farragos. What does that mean? Well, a farrago is something where, like a miscellany, a uh, hotchpotch of bringing various things together uh, that might uh, at first sight seem unrelated. And peripatetic is something you do when you're walking. So, um, this genre, and the reason I called it that, is he wrote three distinct books um, that are journeys that, that, that the, 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 the 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 narrator and perhaps people with him are on a journey and while they while they're on the journey they have conversations or thoughts or musings that lead them in all sorts of directions um away from the actual path that they're on the path to Rome i've mentioned already but there's a, a wonderful book called uh, the four men um and uh i mentioned it briefly earlier the Four Men basically is Belloc is on his way to Europe and he's sitting at a pub uh, in Robertsbridge, which is on the eastern edge of um, Sussex, his shire, uh, his beloved uh, place. And he decides he's not basically he's not going to do the business, the business of the world. He's going to pay homage to his homeland, to his shire. And he decides to walk the length of Sussex from east to west. It's about 75 miles. Um, and in the course of the journey, he meets three other people, hence the title of the four men. So he is myself, the narrator. He meets an old man called Grizzlebeard. He meets uh, a young man called the sailor and a younger man called the poet. And it's the conversations of these four people and their various different outlooks on life. Obviously, the old man, Grizzlebeard, with his experience, sees things differently from the youthfulness of uh, of the uh, poet or the rambunctiousness of the sailor with myself as the mediator shall we say and what we really see here is these are four facets of belloc's own character his own personality he was uh, grizzlebeard he was someone who was a trained historian he got a first class honors degree in history from oxford university he wrote many books of history he understood the history of the church as a catholic he's grizzlebeard right he's a man who is imbued with and lives in the spirit of tradition but he's also a poet and he's also a sailor he has his own boat uh, yacht called the nona and sails to france and sails around the coast of england 
And so it's it's the various aspects of Belloc's own personality in, in, in discussion with himself, which is the sort of thing that happens, by the way, if you've ever been on the long hike solo, you, ha- you have all these conversations in your in your mind. And then um, uh, I mentioned the cruise of the Nona. The, the other one is uh, when he's cruising around the coast of England. Uh, that's not the other peripatetic Farago. We need to move on because we're running out of time. Belloc was also a distributist. In other words, he was a, a, a um, someone who wrote about Catholic social teaching and its political and economic ramifications, what the Catholic Church would call subsidiarity or subsidiarism, what we might now in more popular parlance called localism um, against globalism. Uh, Belloc and Chesterton both wrote books about basically Catholic social teaching, which they called distributism. Belloc's two most important books in this are The Servile State uh, and uh, an essay on the restoration of property. And uh, Chesterton's most important book is a book called The Outline of Sanity on this topic. So Belloc, as an historian, wrote several works on English history and and biographies of English historical figures uh, aimed at um, correcting what he called the Tom Fool Protestant history, the uh, the, the bigoted um, Victor... Victor whitewashes their own role in history version, which is what most British people brought up with. So he he writes, if you like, what might now be called revisionist history, a corrective view of history. He also writes a book called, um, well, H.G. Wells wrote an atheistic outline of history called The Outline of History. And Belloc wrote a response called um, Mr. Belloc, sorry, no, a companion to H.G. Uh, Wells' outline of history. H.G. Wells wrote a response, uh, a book uh, uh, of his own, entitled Mr. Belloc Objects. And Hilaire Belloc wrote a book of his own uh, to that response called Mr. Belloc Still Objects. So four books, two by Wells, two by Belloc, giving the two views, the atheistic view of history, uh, world history, uh, and um, and the Christian view. Chesterton joined the fray, was inspired by this exchange between Wells and Belloc to write his arguably his masterpiece, The Everlasting Man. Like Chesterton, Belloc was a great defender of the faith, and his two great books of apologetics defending the Catholic faith are Survivals and New Arrivals and The Great Heresies. And these are books that look at the history of the church from the perspective of uh, of the errors that have, that have attacked and assailed the church and how the church emerges triumphant over these, these historical errors. Um, survivals and new arrivals. The survivals are the old heresies that remain. The new arrivals are the new ideas, most of which are just the old heresies with new labels. And the great heresies is similar on a similar theme. He mentions, by the way, in that book that 9-11, uh, September the 11th, is a date that should be uh, in every Christian's uh, um, memory as the, the date on which the, the, the Islamic onslaught of Europe was lifted at the Siege of Vienna. Uh, and of course, 9/11 would come back to haunt us when um, when Islamists attacked um, the United States on that date in 2001. All right, so uh, we need to wrap up now because we are running out of time. Um, so I do think that Chesterton and Belloc need to be seen synonymously, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and Belloc needs to emerge from Chesterton's shadow. Um, that they both show that the Catholic faith saves us, as Chesterton said, from being the from being slaves of our own time and being slaves to the zeitgeist. So as the peripheral passes away, only the perennial has permanence. And Belloc writes about the permanent things, ultimately the things of the Catholic faith. Um, so writing of Belloc is really writing about the permanent things He does not die. He does not die. And on that note, I'm going to end with that note. Some lines from uh, Belloc's uh, book, The Four Men. He does not die who can bequeath some influence on the land he knows or dares persistent into wreath love permanent with the wild hedgerows. He rides his loud October sky. He does not die. He does not die. And on that defiant and immortal note, we'll end this discussion of the great Hilaire Belloc. Please do join me next time in the next episode of The Authority. Until then, goodbye, 
God bless and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.